Good afternoon and welcome to the CIO's Best Friends, leveraging CMIOs and CNIOs to foster IT success. A health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Halo Health. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the editor in chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll take those later in the program. Nice way to view the screen. You can click on the top center, get it in side by side mode. Then you can adjust the divider to get the video boxes and the slides size you want them. And it should say speaker view in the top right hand corner. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Becky Fox, CNIO at Atrium Health, Dr. Peleyu, CMIO at Arkansas Children's Hospital, and Allison Marin, VP of Nursing Informatics with Halo Health. And then we will have our Q&A. So let's jump right in. A lot to talk about. A lot of good information we're looking to, to bring out here. Uh, Becky, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. Atrium Health is a large integrated delivery network across North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Um, we have more than 70,000 teammates. We recently just joined and partnered with Wake Forest Baptist and also Floyd uh, Medical Center in, in Georgia. So we're an expanding organization. And my role is the Chief Nurse and Informatics Officer. So I help set the strategy and vision of how we use technology in the hands of our clinicians to really make a difference to our teammates, our workflows, and most importantly to our patients and our communities. So that's that's kind of a, a snapshot view of what I get to do on a day in day out basis. Very good, Becky, thank you. Uh, Pele? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm Pele. Uh, Arkansas Children's is the only freestanding uh, quaternary uh, pediatric health system in the state of Arkansas. We have two hospitals one here in Little Rock, uh, capital city in, in Northwest. And uh, we've got a, a research institute and a clinical integrated network for pediatrics. And my role is I'm the CMIO and uh, I wear a number of hats, but uh, I make sure that the clinical information systems are helpful to the care team so that then we can take care of our patients uh, really well. And that's a good definition that they're helpful to the care teams. I like that. Uh, Allison? Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Allie Morin. I'm HALO's Vice President of Nursing Informatics and um, I'm a pediatric critical care nurse by background. I worked at Boston Children's and Cincinnati Children's, so Pele, I was excited when we got partnered together from the pediatric perspective. Um, what we do at HALO Health is we help organizations standardize and streamline clinical communication and workflows that connect you know, clinical communities together. Um, our platform consolidates outdated technology like pagers and feature phones and, you know, any kind of legacy texting application. And we make sure that there's instant access to EHR results, critical and clinical team activations, um, on-call scheduling, voice over IP call centers, et cetera. So uh, really a breadth of clinical communication and collaboration when our, our vision and our mission is to save patient lives through improved communication. Very good. All right. Well, we're going to talk quite a bit today about how to be effective in these roles, these different roles, how to be effective and what they need from each other. So, uh, Pele, we're going to start with you on this question. Talk about your relationship with your CIO. What do you feel you need from each other to be successful? Oh, great. Yeah, happy to. So um, my CIO and I have very good relations. Um, she is a senior VP. So I'm a VP at the institution, senior VP at our hospital. And our CIO happens to come from the risk management background, so she's a, she was a previous leader in our shop. And um, having said that, and she's a very strong partner for, you know, championing um, uh, the improvement of quality and safety within our within our uh, uh, shop. So we meet regularly and have very open communication. So um, the uh, idea uh, for success, really, with that relationship, is open communication. So the um, from my thinking, you know, the uh, uh, vantage point really from, from my perspective is that, uh, that I have to be very open to her about my ideas because, you know, each CMIO, if you uh, look at other CMIOs in, in, in other institutions, they have very different roles, right? Uh, and I come from an academic uh, research background together with my informatics and clinical background. So I do a number of things in the hospital. So I 
join quality improvement efforts. I, I join innovation projects. I do research. You know, I teach. I, I support the clinical uh, enterprise and also do some mentoring uh, with uh, physicians because I run a uh, informatics, clinical informatics fellowship program here in, uh, in our uh, university. So she's been very supportive of, of me. And I think that uh, having some open communications uh, from me to her is, a, is an important thing and vice versa. Uh, I know uh, where uh, she wants to go and what she wants to do. And whenever, whatever I do, I make sure that I align, align my work with her because um, you know, healthcare is a team teamwork really and um, that's what I, I uh, aim to do every time. So are you saying that that uh, CMIOs are going to come from diverse backgrounds they're probably going to be doing other things uh, as well as their main CMIO job and it's important that you have the latitude and freedom to do those things? Um, so, yeah so yes yeah. so uh, depending on which organization you belong to some of the CMIOs are very operationally bent so this would be supporting the uh, electronic health records, supporting the operations. Uh, on my end, I'm in an academic center. So uh, naturally, the CMIO responsibility is a bit broad. Uh, in addition to the operations, you know, the, we have research, science, innovation, um, as well as mentorship as part of my role. Yeah, and it's important to you to be able to, to do those things, to have the freedom and latitude to do those things. Correct, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm very fortunate in that way because of the shop that I, I am in, you know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. able to do a number of those things in which the organization is very supportive of it. Very good. Becky, your thoughts? You know, for, for us at Atrium and, and some of my other past experiences, um, what I've found that's really helpful is just you have to have a good relationship and you have to be able to collaborate and you have to understand and appreciate where each person's coming from and the expertise and experience that they bring to the table. Um, and that's what I've found in, you know, in working with really great CIOs is they very much appreciate my clinical background. They understand experiences that I've seen, you know, outside the organization, relationships we have and learnings that we gather from working with other organizations. And then how, when, when there is a problem, when I, when I bring the problem and most importantly, some solutions, they're very open to listening to that. And the only reason why they're open to listening to that is because of a good collaborative relationship. So I think that's probably one of the most foundational thing, you know, that you have to trust in either, each other's expertise and, and rely on that to move whatever project initiative quality endeavor forward. Um, and that's what I have found in, in, in having really good relationships with CIOs. And it, it's really like that, a, a triangle, the CMIO, the CNIO, or the chief clinical informatics officer and a CIO, all of those folks have to bring their expertise to the table, rely on each other's expertise, collaborate, and then move things forward and really be supportive of each other. So Becky, um, that's a, you know, interesting point. Um, how can you tell if, if you were on it, how do you, how can you tell if someone's respect, if someone is going to value your opinion? I'm thinking in an interview scenario, it's maybe the questions you're asked and the way you approach, you don't always get to select Sometimes you're going to be there and the CIO is going to come after you. So you don't get right. that opportunity. You're just sort of stuck together. But sometimes you get an opportunity. And I'm thinking maybe in the interview process, you want to see to what degree sort of you're asked questions and engaged and listened to, right? Am I being listened to? Am I being, because you talk about appreciating what I'm bringing to the table. Any more well, thoughts I, around that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the whole idea of that working relationship is, I'm here to help make the CIO successful. Um, I'm here, here to help this, make the CMIO successful. I'm here to help make all of our clinicians successful. And so how do we best collaborate together? So I've had really um, you know, foundational relationship building skills uh, go a long way. So you know, I know we're in the midst of a pandemic, but having lunch, having coffee, even bringing the, the CIO to the bedside to see where there are challenges, uh, can really prove um, to be successful because then when they're in other strategic meetings in the organization, they get to tell those stories of, hey, this is what I heard from the frontline nurses. And this is what I heard from the surgeon when we did a walkthrough of the surgical center, you know, and, and being able to have those, build those relationships and trust um, is really key to making sure that happens. So I would suggest if anyone's interviewing for a role mm -hmm. or looking at a role, that's what you want to ask about is what is the culture? What is the climate? Um, 
and you know, I'm not expecting the CIO if they go on around with me in, in the ICU to understand everything there. But what I want them to say is, hey, remember when I told you that the IV pumps are challenged? Let me show you what that means at the bedside and 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 really serve, you know, our role as a clinical informatics person is to be the translator. So I help explain to the CIO, you know, hey, this is where the IV pumps are a challenge. This is why we need this. This is the impact it will make. And then really applying, um, you know, the business strategic acumen skills and helping serve that to the CIO so they can be successful and, and more knowledgeable in those meetings. But, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, Pele, what, what, what other ex examples have you had? Uh, I just want to piggyback because it, it's just beautiful how you sh share that point of view. Um, uh, our role really uh, are interpreters, right? Trans translationist between uh, the clinical realm and the IS realm. And uh, it's very important for us to be able to explain the clinical aspect of it to our IS uh, team leaders uh, and vice versa. The other way around, um, it's very important for us to be able to explain in clinical terms, in the way our colleagues in the clinical, uh, you know, in the trench would understand the way the complexity of the health IT, just so complex, and we should be able to be able to communicate that across. And I think it's a very important role uh, in an organization. Allison, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I've had experience where I worked in healthcare setting with CNIOs and CMIOs and CIOs. And in my current role, I come into a health system and oftentimes the initiative that we come in to solve, the problem we come in to solve is HIPAA compliant messaging. You know, it's an IT driven project. They come looking for a solution so people aren't doing, you know, cell phone texting back and forth. And what we do is we make sure that the Beckys and the Pele's are at the table. So, you know, oftentimes it'll be, I have a problem I have to solve and we need to buy a solution. And we really make sure that the other clinical leaders come to the table and make sure that they are a part of that whole project wholeheartedly. And then on the flip side, if Becky called me and said, hey, I need a solution for just my nurses who work in XYZ, you know, hospital, we ask the broader question, is your CIO aware of this? Are you bringing, you know, where's your CMIO? Um, because for us, it's really the triad that makes every implementation successful. And we can see that across our customer base, the ones that were IT driven um, with little clinical involvement, maybe don't have the best adoption, don't have the best engagement, whereas the ones where everybody's at the table is really um, where you see, you know, the really good wheels turning and innovation happening. All right, very good. Let's go to our, our next question. Um, the keys to being a successful CMIO or CNIO, um, you know, might be more, even more interesting to say, what would be some of the really bad qualities to be in this position? <laughs> I'm thinking, Pat, let me start with you. Sometimes doctors... They, listen, doctors can be used to barking out orders and everybody's got to scurry around and listen, right? So That's you're, not always true. That's no. not always it, true. It, <laughs> it can happen on occasion, on occasion. I mean, Pele, tell me what you think. you got a physician who maybe is interested in getting inform in, into informatics. Um, is there any way they might have to change their usual approach that you get to have sometimes when you're a doctor? To be successful in that position, it's not going to work for you. It's not going to translate for you to be successful uh, in the CMIO role. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So the, the first thing, I mean, you joke about it, but that is true, right? Uh, if you are a clinician in a clinic, a surgeon, um, that's the reason why it's called an order, because you order something and people do it for you, right? Uh, you understand as a physician in the clinics that whatever you do is, you know, someone's taking action on the things that you have, you know, ordered. Uh, and everything, everyone's working around, but typically when you're doing that, you're, you know, kind of like siloed by, by your work. Um, being a CMIO, really, you, re, you need to remove that barrier and you need to understand concretely, really, that it is teamwork. You can't do your job without other people's uh, engagement, right? Um, the IS, the care team, the admins, all of those need to work together uh, to do that. The other thing is the leadership. So uh, there's a different type of leadership I think CMIOs uh, will need to uh, uh, develop in order to be successful. So it's not the leadership like do what I say and follow me. And, and you know, that's really not what it is because what 
a CMIO uh, should be doing is looking at the organization and how the organization can be successful. So broadening that little perspective uh, is important and that's the leadership style. But the other thing is how do you lead when uh, people that uh, you wanted to uh, influence do not report to you? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm working with my colleagues. I'm a general pediatrician. You know, I'm working with surgeons, anesthesiologists, pathologists, you know, nurses, uh, admins, and they don't really report to me, but we all have shared, we share the same goal, right? To improve certain things. So that's the type of leadership that I think uh, physicians who are in the trenches, you know, would need to flip a little bit so that then instead of looking at the patient, right? We are actually looking at the patient as the organization or the system. So you're broadening your perspective into a system, system of thinking, right? So that's, I think for successful CMIOs, you need to be a systems thinker, you know, thinking about the organization as the patient, you're trying to fix what's, what's, what's uh, wrong. And I think Becky, you've mentioned that uh, we are trans uh, interpreters, you know, good communication, I think is an important thing. Um, and <clears throat> because everything we do is change, you need to have very high emotional quotient because when things change, everything basically what we do is changing something and, and people are really resistant to change unless they see value in it. So uh, understanding how organizations work is another one, um, which you know, clinicians in the trench is very hard for them to do because you're dealing with the patient right there and then. And so stepping back a little bit, you know, broadening the, 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 the framework of how you're operating um, is something that physicians who wanted to be in this type of role need to like shift the way they're thinking. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, th what we have found over the years is that there's just, it's not even the CMIO just doing medical, you know, doctors focused area. I mean, it, it's the entire care team is complex and intertwined and interconnected. And so that's why it is really important to be the great translator and understand the system-wide perspective of how everything works together. So um, while my focus is on nursing, at the same time, I look across the organization, outside the organization, understand other things that are influencing. And then our role is to translate to the IT what the needs are of the clinicians and translate to the clinicians what the opportunities are with IT. So we're really here to build bridges, to bring people together and collaborate. And then most importantly, to um, serve to just make everyone's life easier. So, so how can I have, you know, it's easier when the IT folks get to focus on IT. So if I can help serve as a translator to the clinicians saying, this is why we have to do this upgrade. This is why we have to put in this component. This is the time frame. How do we work together to make sure that this time frame is going to fit into all the other things that we have to do um, and being open and uh, creative to like, well, this is a different way we can do it or other options to slice and dice and implementation. Um, I found that, that that again, allows the clinicians to be successful, allows the IT to be successful and then allows the organization to be successful. So, you know, uh, you know, Pele hit it right, right on the nail. You know, you, you've got to really serve as the great translator and, and really be um, having great relationships in both aspects, the clinical operations folks, as well as with your IT so that everyone continues to move forward. And you just remove, you know, now more than ever in the midst of the, the continued pandemic, continued short staffing, and you know, not certain as to what holds in the future. We have to, our role is even more important because we have to continue to you know be laser focused on how do you remove friction in healthcare um, because that's what makes a difference to the patients and the outcomes in our communities. Very good, Allison. Yeah, I mean, I'll, piggybacking on the great translator comment, I think the other successful components are are. Uh, patience and listening. I think there's there's an opportunity um, to listen to before we translate, you know, to kind of just listen to what the problem is, what are the issues, what are we trying to solve, and spending a lot of time digesting and understanding that, and then having patience for the solution, right? So um, I'm sure we've all been, been called and said, we have to change this right now because it's affecting this thing. And 
to your point, you have to think about the entire enterprise. You have to think about if I change that order set, who else does it impact? If I ask my team to build this, what's the downstream impact? And I think, um, you know, good leaders and good CNIOs and CMIOs take that feedback in, translate, digest, and then, you know, reciprocate that out to the, to the, correct, um, the correct teams or what have you. I have the pleasure of being able to translate to our product team. So I hear feedback from our customers and, you know, I get to go back to them and say, you know, we heard this at this site. It's a little different than what we've seen before. We've collectively looked at it from a clinical perspective with our internal clinical committee. We agree with it and, you know, here's why we're going to do it. And here's what the impact for our whole customer base will be. So, you know, it's, it's translating on both sides too. It's not just translating to our internal teams, it's then translating back out to our, to our customer base and our clients and saying, you know, here's what we've heard you, here's what we're doing to solve the problem. Yeah, go. go ahead. Oh, I wanna try to pick on what Allison had mentioned uh, uh, briefly in her statement. Um, so the eye for improvement, right? So the reason why we're changing is we wanna move forward, right? Uh, and that also, I think, is an ingredient for a successful CNIO, CMIO, um, that there's this ability to see something and want to move forward with it. So uh, with health IT, there's just so much opportunity for discovery, right? Mm -hmm. So much opportunity for innovation, so much in, uh, opportunity for science, now that we're talking about COVID, and so much opportunity for res research. Uh, and all, all of those things uh, uh, could be a, a useful I would say uh, uh, area of focus for CMIO, CNIOs, because in any hospital, you know, community, academic, you know, that can be an area where CNIO, CMIOs can support and 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 you know move forward a little bit uh, with a, a little bit of gas, you know, on on the pedal there. Uh, this way, you know, things will move forward and move forward in more innovatively. So, mm, very good. Um... You know, we're going to talk a little bit about where the job gets tough and the main challenges. And um, I was thinking that change, the job is all about affecting change and change is always hard. Um, so getting clinicians to do things differently, even if you've done all the right change management techniques and you've brought them on board and you've had committees and all this and, and you've done everything right, change is hard and you're somewhat responsible for adoption, I would imagine, when the organization has decided we're going to this new EMR or we're gonna do this or that, whatever it is, um, clinician adoption is somewhat on you, right? I mean, you. so that's tough. That's a tough place to be. Um, and then it goes, you know, the feedback from the clinicians to IT, you know, it goes both ways. So let's talk a little bit about the, you know, the toughest parts of it. Becky, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenge is you know, it's not, you know, I think uh, Paley said it, you know, it's not just you, it's a whole team, either team that works directly with you or another team that you work with. And so to me, the biggest challenge in going through change management is making sure that you have the right team to help with that change management. So I would love to think that I'm the sole person responsible for changing, but, but I'm not, there's a whole team. We have a team of clinical informaticists, and, and they become the ambassadors and the champions of our culture of change. And how do we get through that? So it's really important, you know, at, at my time at Atrium Health, we have evolved our clinical informatics um, team so that now they all do serve as ambassadors. Most of them are masters prepared, board certified, understand informatics very well, and, and can look across the system um, uh, perspective. You have some of those same qualities that you've already heard about high emotional intelligence that can serve as translators. And so that's really, I think, the biggest challenge as a CNIO and a CMIO, um, and even as a CIO, that if you're going to go forward and do something, if you don't have the right ambassadors that are on uh, boots on the ground at the facilities, working with clinicians and leaders, then it'll be even harder to get anything changed. So to me, it's about building the right culture in the teams that you have, making sure that you um, have the right makeup and composite. You know, I, I know some organizations have looked to having approximately one uh, clinical informatics 
informaticists for about every three to 400 beds. Some of them are, uh, have more, you know, one clinical informaticist for about every 250 beds. But you, you really need to have some kind of guide to say, do we have the right composite on our team for any change that we're going to go forward with? And then the other thing is making sure that you get those clinical informaticists plugged in at the right time. You know, historically, organizations, you know, bring the clinical informaticists in kind of at the last minute after everything's mm -hmm. built, designed, tested, and that's not the right time to bring them in. So what we have really gone through in evolution is realizing that before we even start a project, we need to have a clinical informaticist involved right from the get-go. They already understand the challenges in the clinicians. They understand the, the scope of the project. They understand our goals and what we're trying to solve. And then they help become the champions. So to me, it's about having the right team, having the right attitude and culture, and then you can, you can do anything. That's a great piece of very specific advice, Becky. So thank you for that. Um, Allison, why don't you jump in here? Sure. So, you know, our what we see from the challenges, we're the outsider coming in, right? So we our challenge is telling you or telling our customer, here's our best practices, here's our recommendations on how we would do this. We've done this, you know, several hundred times. And, you know, we kind of get told we've got it, we figured this out, we know how we're gonna do our stuff. Thank you very much. And then, you know, we get to that crunch time you know, the week before go live and there, there's a little bit of a panic moment of, oh my gosh, we, you know, we maybe don't have our ducks in a row. And so, you know, for us, it's kind of keeping that constant um, pressure and, and push to say, have you thought about this? Have you seen that? You know, our experience with this kind of implementation. So, you know, as an outsider coming in and, and I've been on the inside and I've had vendors come to me and say, we want you to do A, B, and C. And I've said, no, I'm good. Thanks for your help. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I've been in both in both seats. So um, you know, I think that's probably our our greatest challenge as a vendor. And and I'd love to hear, you know, from Pele and Becky how you receive that kind of feedback and if you uh, you know, guidance for us on kind of how to how to tiptoe through that that, you know, I don't know, field of of kind of landmines to make sure we yeah. don't uh we don't ask you to do something that's out of the realm of doing. Pele, why don't you jump in? I, I think this is a fascinating issue, Allison. So I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Well, I'll, yeah. So I'll, I'll try to piggyback on that. So, uh, so I'll comment on two things. One is the change management piece, right? It's uh, getting buy-in from our clinician colleagues, or you know, are, or can be challenging. You know, particularly if clinicians don't feel that you have their best interest in mind, right? So they could see that, they could feel that. Uh, then it'll be very, very challenging to relate with them. So ultimately, I think being an advocate for patient care um, uh, and being clear that, you know, how these informatics tools, so the, the tools that you're suggesting, Allison, you know, how these changes can impact the care that they provide to their patients you know, is the best way to engage with them because um, aligning from, for the same goal, I think is the, is, is the key because we are all on the same uh, page or team when it comes to this. The other challenge that I see, which is more technology, right? Uh, is the impact of our siloed healthcare. So now our healthcare in the US is mostly episodic, transactions-based fee-for-service and the health IT systems, unfortunately are designed to support that because that's exactly how we're gonna get paid, how we get through the things. But the patients uh, move between these care settings, right? Don't care if it's ER, uh, ambulatory or, or clinic or you know, uh, outside in the community, but the information about their care should move with them, right? And, uh, and, and solving patient, a, a, a patient care issue is often multi multidisciplinary and multi-system. So I think, Becky, you've mentioned that, you know, it's not really just about the physicians or the nurses. It's about how teams work. So if your data architecture, your information systems, or your integration engines don't support the movement of this patient information, then there will be really issues. And that's very tough, you know, issues with trying to connect the information flow so that then the providers, the nurses, the decision makers, and the rest of the care team would have this shared mental model of uh, the patient's health and the care that we provide to them. And, and technically that's very, very challenged. So sometimes organizations choose integrated systems, right? Uh, although integrated systems still have siloed stuff, but that seems to be a, a challenge that, you know, I think uh, it's, it's, it's challenging to this date, uh, at least for our organization. That's interoperability is a huge issue, and we have specific webinars on that. Um, so any more thoughts around that, Becky? 
Well, I was just going to say, Allison, I think you're right. You know, it's, we always know better than the vendor, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but, 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 I, but I think, you know, we've also, uh, you know, learned from those experiences of like, oh my gosh, I really didn't listen as well as I should have. So um, I do think it's important for vendors though, when they have people like you in your role, I'm going to listen a little bit more because I know you understand the workflow because you are a clinician. So I do think it's important for us to recognize, you, you know, clinician informaticists serve as just a great translator, whether you're working on product development, implementation, consulting at the bedside or in the community, um, the, the, that role is just so incredibly valuable because you can, you can be on either side or a foot in e either camp and really bring everybody together. You serve as the glue, uh, hopefully the glue, not the divider, um, <laughs> but it is really important. And, and I think, um, you know, com the complexity of healthcare is not gonna go away. It will only continue. Um, and so we need to have people in the right place, giving the right advice and suggestions and guidance and bringing people together um, it, across the spectrum in order to make, make a bigger impact to healthcare for all of us. All right, let's get it. We're going to get a little specific here and talk a little bit about a specifically care team collaboration and uh, and rolling out that product, which is a very important one. Um, how can CIOs, CMIOs, and CNIOs work together to effectively select, roll out, and support a care team collaboration tool? Now, Allison would just say, well, if you just listen to us, you won't have any problems, <laughs> right? Just do just what, what Ali says, and it'll be do fine. What we tell you to do, <laughs> right? So, my life would be much easier and so would everybody else's no i'm just no, no 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 listen it, it's a that's a whole issue with any service provider it's a great point service providers uh they they have a way if they're good they have a method right and they propose that method and uh, the way i would describe it is there's deal breakers meaning you have to do this or we won't move forward and then there's the flexible stuff which is well, we recommend it this way, but if you don't want it to do it this way, it's okay. But every vendor has to have deal breakers, right, Allison? I mean, there has to be things that you say, no, we just won't be able to move forward because that's not going to work. Yep, we do. And well, I mean, there's the technical deal breakers, but also from a relationship and, uh, and you know, customer perspective, we always ask the problem at the outset. Like we always ask the question, what problems are you trying to solve with implementing this technology? Um, because again, we can, be, we can be bought for secure messaging, but that's not really our space. We wanna come in and help you improve your clinical communication and collaboration. So we need to come up with consensus from the CMIO, CIO, CNIO on what, what they expect the outcomes to be before we kind of start our project. Um, and, you know, we'll hear, we want to go live by January. Well, let's talk about how we're going to get to January because there's a lot of things that you have to agree upon um, before. And we want to know what you want to measure, right? Because we are a clinically focused company and we care about your outcomes. We don't care just about turning the technology on, adding to the technology stack in a healthcare system that can be just another thing somebody has to use, right? So, you know, we're really about um, trying to align at the very beginning. We have two groups that we meet with. We, we align a health systems leadership, which is those three C's. And then we have a standing cadence with an executive steering committee. And, you know, that's really how we, um, we support the customer as, after they've selected us to make sure that that leadership alignment continues. And those, you know, there's hard decisions that need to be made sometimes. There's, you know, there's people who aren't gonna be happy with this technology and we wanna support and have that, you know, top-down kind of buy-in before we uh, move forward with turning it on. So, you know, that's kind of how we approach it um, after you've picked us. Mm, very good. Pele, your thoughts on rolling out this specific uh, type of tool and some yeah. advice there. Yeah, so uh, we in the health IT world think of it as a hammer, right? So we have a solution for everything. Uh, one a perspective that I think might be helpful is that um, we, we, we need to solve the uh, analog world first, you know, uh, before we uh, use technology to solve it or digital technology to solve it. So one example, you know, like one of the major causes of patient safety uh, are uh, adverse events, right, of uh, medications. You know, we, 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 we hurt patients because of the, the meds that we give to them. And one of the things that we do uh, analog, you know, physically in the workplace is that we reconcile the medications. We 
see what the patient's having, and then we, you know, physicians, clinicians would say, okay, this one you can continue, this one you can discontinue, and this one we're going to add on, and so on. Learning about those things is important. Then, uh, you know, tools like uh, health IT, you would have process built in into that um, in, in in the system, and if the end users are having different workflow, right? In the way they think and the way they, they're constructed, then you lay over the technology, even if you've understood the problem, uh, it's very hard for them to adapt to it because it's, mm -hmm. it's clunky, right? So um, CMIO, CNIO, CIOs can probably work together to figure those things out, you know, fix the analog issues first, you know, fix the workflow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then understanding it so that then when you layer that technology on top, you hardwiring the good mm -hmm, mm -hmm. process. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very important thing that we have to know. It's very easy, e uh, easy to say, but very, very hard to do because a lot of the technologies are built in. It's hard to reconfigure, you know, what's, what's um, the technology being in place. And even if we think that it is coordinating because the way we design information systems, we, we think through, you know, the process built in, there's a specific step, but people again, work in silos. Uh, and so if they don't know where their effort is in the bigger context of the care continuum, very hard for them to get buy-in and follow the, the technology, so. It's funny you say that, Pele. I was, um, I was on site at a prospective customer yesterday and they have an existing communication technology in place. And you know, a lot of the questions they were asking was, can you do this because that's what their existing system has? And I said, you know, how long have you had this system? Oh, we've had it for two years. I said, what did you do before that? And did that work better than your system? To, to your point of let's figure out what workflow problem we're trying to fix before we add a different type of technology thinking it's going to make it better. You know, it's that whole Einstein, if I keep doing the same thing over and over, I'm going to get a different answer. So again, we just play back to play back to them. You know, what are you what are you trying to solve? And is that, it's not solving it for you today, obviously, because you're asking us to do the same thing that it does. So let's go back or let's go forward to what the right, you know, kind of change in workflow should be and see if we can solve that problem. Yeah, the other thing I'd add to that too, Allie, is that the reality is, is that things change. So when you make a decision to move forward with whatever tool or process that it's going to be in that time frame that you're implementing, things might change, the workflows might change, and that's okay. It's okay mm -hmm. if things change. So for example, um, you know, at Atrium Health, we use Halo and we, we, when we rolled out Halo, we had our very purest ideas of that, you know, Halo is only going to be used for clinical communication and nothing else. There, there will be no, no other communication that's all, what it's all gonna be used for. Well, at the same time that we're rolling that out, you know, the rest of the world continues to get a smartphone in their pocket. They do texting with their friends and family and, and have unlimited texting now. And there, there's all these outside influences that now impact how people use the tool. And then there's just a reality that, hey, if I need to send an emergency message about an operational thing to all of our clinicians, then I need to do that. So it's not about a patient, but it's, you know, hey, today we're doing CPR class in the lobby, whatever it might be. And that's okay if we, you know, that was our original goal and it's okay to metamorphosize that and change it based on the cultural dynamics. So I think, you know, five, 10 years ago, we would say, nope, these were our three goals for the project and we're sticking with those three goals and thou shalt not change them. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is don't sweat it and just move, move on and say like, hey, this is a better goal now. We're, we're still focusing, we're still directionally correct. So that's what I, I try to ask my team because we do have humans involved in all these things. So when you have humans involved, as try as you mo and as you may, it, it still might not be perfect. And so you have to ask yourself, are we doing the right thing for patients? Are we doing the right thing for our organization and our teammates? And are we doing the right thing by moving in the right direction? And if the answer is yes to those, then don't sweat the small stuff, reevaluate your goals and keep moving forward. Yeah. All right, very good. Um we're going to do our Ask a Co-Panelist feature now, my favorite part. And Allison, we're going to let you go first. Do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? I do. Pele, I'm so interested in your clinical informatics program that you chair at the university. Tell me more about curriculum. Who's like, who's your audience? That You said that at the very first question. And I said, now I know what I'm going to ask Pele about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, so th this must my second uh fellowship program that I've established, you know, there are about 47, 48 
uh, training programs in the country uh, that are ACGME accredited. So this means that it's um, a, a, uh, accredited by you know, the academic uh, um, uh, in, uh, pro programs across the country. So my fellowship program is a subspecialty training program. So uh, people come here with uh, already having their primary uh, specialty, uh, like a pediatrician, internal medicine, a radiologist or psychiatrist. They go into subspecialty training and it's a two-year fellowship uh, and um, our program, when you come out of it, uh, you get a certificate degree in biomedical informatics, uh, and you also get hands-on training and, you know, stuff that we talked about here, interoperability, uh, uh, change management, you know, organizational theory, data science, machine learning, those kinds of things. And we get through that so that then when they complete their, their two-year fellowship, they're ready to, ready to take the boards uh, for the, 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 the specialty, uh, and they're ready to you know, uh, become CMIOs or uh, directors of IT, uh, informaticists um, uh, moving forward. That's great. Very I think cool. it sounds pretty cool. I wish you had a virtual option. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, now we're more virtual than hands-on because right. uh, uh, COVID. And, and I think it's so, so important to have those types of programs out there in the world to give everyone real-life experiences, you know. Um, I know Allie and I talked about this before when, and, and I'm sure Paley, you have it, you know, when you, when you're, you know, going to college and you say, I want to be a nurse. I mean, there's so many different options that you have from nursing and places that you could work. Same thing. If you want to be a physician or a provider, you know, there's so many opportunities and, and the same holds true for informaticists that you can truly go work anywhere. And so it's really hard sometimes when people are getting schooling to understand where they're going to be good, where they're going to excel and what they're going to love and be passionate about. And so by having a fellowship program is just awesome to get real life experiences, understand that, okay, I can do, I can do design work, but maybe that's not really where I want to spend the rest of my career, you know, um, and really understand, you know, what opportunities are out there. So that I, I think that's awesome. I'm, I'm feverishly writing down some notes because I might be sending a few people your way. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Happy to talk to them about this. All right, very good. Pele, do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so uh, how do we grow more CNIO leaders in the community, right? Um, what are the typical barriers for, let's say, an average organization to say, you know what, um, we need a CNIO. Uh, and, you know, CMIO, uh, I think a, a number of hospitals now tend to have some type of CMIO ro type role. Um, uh, CNIOs may uh, not as much, right? Um, and again, please correct me if, if, if that's not uh, entirely you know, accurate, but how, do, how does one grow uh, leaders like you, like, uh, like you in the community? Becky? Well, w one of the things I'm really um, a big proponent of is, you know, there are people that will pick a career and stay in that role for their entire longevity of their career. Um, but I do think there is value in moving people around to different roles and having influence. So for example, um, if you have clinical informaticists and you do a fellowship or some type of internship and you get some exposure, maybe it would be good to work on the implementation team or the, or the design team for a six month or a year period. And then also taking that knowledge and experience and then moving to a different team that does support. So um, organizations that I've worked with that have really looked at that of, of saying, you know, we want to build these great skills of clinical informaticists, but we also want to give them opportunities to move and have influence in different spaces. And so what I have seen is a trend towards looking towards that of saying, you know, we have a clinical informaticist and it, it, don't get me wrong, I love having clinical informaticists want to stay in that role for their entire career, but is there also value in having them go and work in operations, in work in employee health, in work in um, other areas, because they take that informatics knowledge with them. Um, and then again, you know, when you're collaborating through projects, you have a little bit different perspective. So I have seen some trends with some other colleagues across the United States and beyond that are looking at of how do you create this kind of fluidness of it's okay if, if you know, Allie's in one role for two years and then she actually moves to a different role still within the organization because she's going to take and expand that knowledge. So I do think when you, um, when you create those types of situations, that's how you can really build 
and bring people on and, and continue to, to make a difference. All right, very good. Uh, Becky, did you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Well, I just, uh, I wanted to ask them both, you know, it sounds kind of silly, but I just love hearing these stories of like, how did you get into, I mean, I'm sure when you went to medical school, you didn't say one day I'm going to grow up and be the CMIO. So how did you, how did you get here? Because I always think these are kind of interesting stories of how people get there. Um, and, and just hopefully that will help inspire some other people to know, like you might not be the CMIO or CNIO today, but there's always a way to get there and, um, and maybe just share your path to your yes. current role. Yeah, so in 1996, I uh, uh, was a community pediatrician in South Carolina. The third year of my practice, I got involved in a Baldridge Award project for the health system and it clicked on me. Well, I didn't know that you can improve on improvement, right? There, I, it just did not dawn on me. And within that quality improvement, quality uh, effort, I learned about the importance of data for informing you of where you are, when you want to go and how to improve it, and then learn about medical informatics. It was in 1998, 99, when I started looking into the word medical informatics. And since then I went back to school, did a fellowship, and I've been doing this type of role in 2005. And, and um, uh, you know, in, implementing EHRs, uh, doing research on it, and, and uh, uh, so, it's been a crazy thing. Like you're absolutely right. I didn't, I, I that's just not my, my vision. I wanted to be a pediatrician, but then again, there with quality, I learned about the gaps in quality and safety. And uh, then, you know, with the health IT, that it, it is pot the potential to like address the gaps. And even up to now, that's exactly my, my pipe dream. Um, and mm -hmm. you're using health IT to improve care, so. Allison, how'd you get to where you are? Sure. So um, around the year 99, 2000, I was an ICU nurse at Cincinnati Children's. I'd been doing it for a few years. I didn't know what the word burnout was, but certainly looking back, I think I was the description of burnout, you know, um, and somebody tapped my shoulder and said, hey, we need super users. We're about to go from paper charting to this, you know, online documentation system. You, people seem to respect you. Can you kind of learn how to do this and teach other people? So, you know, that was kind of my first entry. And then a little bit later after that, I got tapped again and said, hey, you know, do you want to be an analyst on this project? Because the next thing we're going to do is care plans and education and discharge planning. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, you don't have to work nights anymore. And I said, <laughs> sign me up. I'll be there. When do, can I come Monday, you know, nine to five? It sounds fantastic. Um, you know, so that was kind of my first step away from the bedside. And then, you know, I had the, the pleasure of, of working at Cincinnati Children's doing that and then working at Boston Children's and implementing Cerner and kind of managing the nursing care team implementation and all the documentation there. And then um, you know, landed back in Cincinnati. And ultimately, it's been four years that I've been at Halo, and it's it's been a great ride um, to be here and to be a part of, you know, changing healthcare. And it's really interesting to look at it across multiple facilities, right, and seeing all the change that can happen, opportunities for improvement, amazing innovations that healthcare systems are doing with our technology and other technologies. I feel, you know, really lucky to have this kind of purview across across a lot of healthcare spaces right now. Now, Becky, you have to tell us your story. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I uh, it must have been something about the 90s, right? So I had a, a, a <laughs> We're all sharing our age. Yeah, exactly. So I had a friend of mine who um, called me up and said, hey, I'm, she, was, she had moved over and started working in IT. And she said, I need someone to come over and translate for the, for the techies because um, they don't understand clinical. Can you come over? And I remember... Um, when I got, went to go tell my boss at the time that I was no longer going to work in nursing, um, I remember getting a little teary eyed thinking, oh my gosh, I'm giving up my nursing career. My mom's going to kill me. You know, <laughs> so I paid for graduate school. <laughs> and so, um, and then ironically, you know, and then I remember sitting there in those first few months of meetings and going, you know, whispering to someone like, hey, what does HL7 mean? What is, mm -hmm. you know, and then my favorite, what is an ID10T? What is a picnic <laughs> for all the IT people out there that'll laugh? You know, the problems in the in the chair, not in the computer. You know, um, you know. And so now I laugh back at those. But then, you know, six months later, you really understand because they they wanted me to be successful and they were so gracious and invested in me. Um, 
and so the the rest is history. And then I spent some time, you know, working it with a large IT vendor, traveled around the world, got to see a lot of healthcare systems on their journey, and then um, and now as a CNIO. So it's been a great journey. And and it, and then I laugh, of course, because every single day I use my nursing clinical knowledge, and that's the that's the funny part of all. Uh, is that, you know, what you don't know when you get into it, but it can be the most rewarding experience to ever have. So I'm hoping that everybody who watch, watches this and, and listens is inspired and, and, and not afraid to jump in because we definitely need more clinical informaticists to help make a difference and, and, um, and make a difference to our patients, our clinicians and to the world. So. All right, we're going we're gonna to go with a final thought here, a, a parting word of advice uh, to your colleagues who may be listening. Um, assume you got someone on the line who's just having a tough time, maybe in a particular project in, in one of these roles, CMIO, CNIO role. What's your parting word of advice, Pele? Oh, okay. So my thoughts are, you know, if people are interested in these types of roles that we're having in this, in this, this panel and you're, you know, ha having uh, some, some difficulty here, I think the primary reason why we're doing this is really to make healthcare better for patients and for our care team. So um, you know, translating that in your day-to-day -day -day work, and it's not, not really about the technology, um, although it is, right, <laughs> but uh, that's not the main focus here, so, um, but I think that what you can do is, uh, it, uh, again, using the translation here, uh, that health IT or informatics and technology has such a potential to improve healthcare, uh, and being in this field is just so much, so much rewarding, and uh, really, it's a privilege, actually, right, to be in these types of position, because um, only in healthcare institutions like, you know, where we're at right now are these types of roles appreciated. And, and I, I believe that there's value in, in you know, whatever we do as, as, as informaticians. So um, always focus on the patient. I think that's where everyone can align to. IS can align to patient care. Physicians can align to patient care. Nurses can align to patient care. So if you're having difficulty, use that as a, 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 frame, of, a frame of mind to uh, navigate your way around it. Excellent advice. Very good. Becky? Yeah, relationships matter. So you have to have a good relationship with your CIO, your CMIO, and figure out how you can help each other. And because when you have that, that trifecta all comes together, then that's when you're really able to, to do great things. And so you have to have a good working relationship. You have to be able to trust each other. You have to be able to listen and have good emotional intelligence. Um, and that's how you can make things happen. But it really comes down to that relationship is really key to making your, yourself successful. Excellent, Becky. Thank you. Allison, you get the last word today. And I think, you know, just pigging back on that, I think those relationships are so important because they support alignment. And I think that alignment for your organization and your patients is really, you know, the most successful um, ones that we see is when people are aligned and share that, uh, you know, that professional relationship of looking out for the best for their people as well as the patients and the community um, that you support and provide care to. Excellent. Well, that's about all we had time for today regarding continuing education. You could use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand recording of this webinar is ready for viewing. If you want to sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team and you can go to our site to register for upcoming webinars. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel, Becky Fox, Dr. Peleu, and Allison Morin. And I want to thank Halo Health for making this conversation possible and, and our attendees for continuing to join our webinars. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Everyone, thank you.